Good morning, Crossbridge family. We're so glad that you joined us today. My name is Daniel Gonzalez, and this is my friend Morgan Gallion. Morgan, how's your week been? Dan, it's been a pretty good week, but you know what I'm excited for? What's that? That cold weather coming next week, Dan. I've it's been, about time. Yes, I've been refreshing my weather app. There you go. I'm very ready for the cold weather. Dan, something people may not know about you is you got married last month. I did get married last month. Uh, what is something that's just been most surprising about being married? I think the biggest thing that surprised us was like all the friends and family that just came around and blessed us and supported us. It was really, really cool. That's super awesome. Well, we're going to listen to another story about someone that's encountered something surprising about God. Hey, I just wanted to share a quick story that I think will encourage you as we all uh, continue to pursue God's best in and through these 21 days of fasting. Last year, I believed God gave me this promise to, and was asking me to pray for about 200 students to attend our summer youth camp. And then the, the COVID-19 crisis hit and we had to transition from an in-person camp to a virtual camp. And I was like, well, God, I guess there goes that promise. But as that as that initial fast began to close, I felt like the Lord wanted to teach me something about contending, something about pursuing his best in the middle of the promise. So he didn't release me from that fast. And I just continued to pray, continued to ask God and continued to seek that clarity. Well, as we transitioned to that online camp, um, we had about 180 students registered. And um, like many people, I was like, oh, wow, God, thank you for those 180. And maybe there's just gonna be um, another 20 or so that that'll join us online and, and that's how we'll get to the 200. Well, uh, our, we had our online camp. It was amazing. God changed the lives of some students. And then I was sitting with Lindsay Havikin, our student ministry administrator, and she was sharing with me some of the specific stories and some of the specific details. And she just kind of casually told me one day, oh yeah, we had over 205 students um, that were registered for camp, that were a part of our online camp. And I was just blown away that, yeah, it's this small detail and it's not really about the numbers, but how good God is as we pursue him. And I believe over these next 14 days, he wants to remind us that he really is the God of Ephesians 3. He wants to do more than we can ask, hope, or imagine. So regardless of what method of fasting you're using, I wanna encourage you to um, ask God what he wants you to contend for, what you might be able to let that, um, that hunger pain or um, the absence of social media, what you might be able to use that for as you contend for something, as you ask him and ask largely for that thing. And I know we're all gonna be blessed. So let's start sharing those stories. Whether you email a friend or text somebody in your life group, or even share it with us and we can share it with other people. And that's what we're after in our 21 day fasting together as a church. We want to be expectant for the exciting things that God's gonna do. And so if you haven't joined us on this fasting journey, you can text the word fasting to 77411 and that'll just get you included in our daily text messages to encourage you in your daily fast. And if you weren't able to join us last week, that's okay, jump in today. Yeah, and just a reminder for you guys, next week is fall back, so be sure and set your clocks. Also, for the second service, we're going to move it up to 10.15 instead of 10 o'clock, and this allows us to have more time in between services so you can go pick up your kids and so that we can clean the auditorium for the next service coming in. So let's stand together as we prepare our hearts for worship. Thanks, Dan. I just remembered that next week is fall back. Does that mean we get an hour or lose an hour? Hey! <laughs> if you don't have a reason to praise God, <laughs> you just found one. <laughs> I'm so expectant today. The Lord just moved so mightily last night for the revival night. If you were there, raise your hand with us. We got a few, we got a few. Man, we're just here to exalt Jesus. And when he comes, everything changes. And he's here right now with us. So God, we, we make room for you in our hearts right now. We say all this is for you. You're the guest of honor. Be exalted in our worship. Be exalted in our praise. Let every eye be on you. Let every heart be surrendered to you. We lay down our offering today. We make a choice right now to step in, to give you our all. Thank you, God, that you're still moving in power you're moving in power right now. Sing 
when darkness when darkness tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy i own when brokenness and pain is all i know i won't and i won't be shaken no i won't be shaken my fear and my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when i I'm not afraid to leave my past behind And I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Come on, sing it! My fear! And my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance Standing on the rock. Come on, cast your cares on it. No reason to be afraid. Receive joy in his presence. Fullness of joy. Yeah, Jesus. We worship you. Come on, just say his name, Jesus. Call on his name, Jesus. The healer of our bodies the defender of the weak, Jesus. We call on your name, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for being here. Jesus, thank you for your blood that covers us. Jesus, thank you for your mercy that is new this morning. So we step into your presence. Sing every breath. Every breath, it is a gift. Every moment is a treasure. 
So I lay down my past Oh, my past and my regrets My present and my future Every table Every table is a feast Every heartbeat is an altar Every step a mystery Every step a mystery Cause I'm walking with the author Let's fix our eyes So I fix my eyes upon you I fix my eyes upon you So I fix my eyes on you, Jesus I fix my eyes upon you I fix my eyes and all praise all praise heaven bent to me as Father, Son and Spirit all praise all praise God and men together one with us forever
should my heart grow weary? Don't be so downcast, oh my soul. You are in every moment. You are my greatest miracle. I 
Yes, Lord, we declare. Yes, Jesus, we declare that's where you are. This song is straight out of Daniel chapter 1. If you want to understand it, go back and read it. Because Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel in the fire. But there is another, the Lord God. Whatever your fire is, when you turn to Him, He is with you. Jesus, we celebrate that. We declare it, God. We may not feel it, but that does not change the reality of it. And as we declare it, Lord, the Spirit affirms us on the inside. Yes, yes, I am with you. We celebrate that, God, because we are a people who want to be with you. That's why we're here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. Good morning to you. So pleased that you joined us today. Let me remind you of some things. Always pull out your uh, camera, phone, and point it at the screen. We're going to put a QR code. Let's see. It's going to come up in three, two, one. There it is. Hold your camera phone. If you're, on the, uh, if you're uh, with us at home, just point that phone up on your screen. If you've got an extra device, don't take a picture. But when you point your camera at it, a website's going to pop up that shows you all the events at Crossbridge that are going on during the week. Sunday morning is just the launching pad, okay? There's lots more going on. If you need help with this, find a teenager or someone who's under the age of 10, okay? Awesome. Let me tell you a little bit. I think I want to start each week reminding us of what we're doing as a church. What, what is Crossbridge all about? And it's summed up in three statements that Jesus said. And I want to show those on the screen. One of those is to love God. Our desire is that you all and together we encounter Jesus. We don't want to just talk about Jesus. We don't want to just study a book. We want to encounter the Jesus, the God that the book speaks about. So we want you to encounter Jesus and to encounter Him together personally. Secondly, we want to love others. We love each other inside by teaching and worshiping, by being in life group together and, and loving one another that way. We also love one another by volunteering and, and serving in that way. We love people that are outside our fellowship by serving and caring for them and telling them about Jesus. That's the greatest gift of love that we can. And then the third thing we want to do is we want to go, because Jesus told us to go and make disciples of all nations. We want to teach you, help you become a disciple and to follow Jesus and walk with Him. But more than that, we want to help you become an actual disciple maker so that you can go back to your home, to your neighborhood, to your workplace, to your city, to our nation, to the end, all the nations of the earth, taking the gospel of Jesus so that you actually know how to share your faith 
and encourage people, teaching them how to pray and study the Bible. So these are the three things that we're about. Loving God, loving others, and going and making disciples of all nations. Now, one other thing I want to say is that I always want you to be obedient in, your, in our generous giving. You know, giving generously is just one of the areas of life in which God has called us to be obedient. But in every area of life, in every area of life where God calls us to obey, when we do that, He always blesses, always. And that's how we walk into the blessing, by obeying Him. And we can do that also through our giving. Another thing is that we're rebuilding our children's ministry. We've got some awesome volunteers that have made it possible for us now to have our kids zone and our baby zone, but we're rebuilding. And so it's an all play kind of a situation, all hands on deck. So if your kids are in the children's ministry, we need you to be in the children's ministry. We've got a million different ways you can serve. Once a month, twice a month, every week, whatever. You can come to a service and then serve. But you can be expecting a call this week from our children's ministry staff, this week or next, so asking you and seeing where you might plug in and serve. You don't have to be a teacher. You can just be a greeter or a lover, or a hugger of kiddos when we're back into hugging and all that. I'm back into it now, by the way. Um, so I wanna encourage you in that. And then today, uh, last thing I've got on my list is today I've asked Pastor Matt to bring the Word to us and to teach us. I love hearing Matt teach because he just has a depth of wisdom about the Bible and just knows how to make it come alive in a way that exhorts us. And it's not just a, oh, that was an interesting teacher. It is a yes I want to do that, and I want to follow Jesus, and that's what we can expect today. So let's stand together, and as we do, I'm going to pray. We're going to sing one more song of worship to God. Stand with me now, and if you're at home, stand with me too. Whatever we're doing here, you do it there, all right? Jesus, we love you. We celebrate you. We're going to declare your worth, and we're going to mean every word. Lord, and if we can't, we're going to find one word, and we're going to mean that word. Because, Lord, we are going to be a people that walk in the power and the authority of Jesus Christ and declare the honor and wisdom and love and greatness of our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us.
So we come to you this morning and we surrender, God. We surrender. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. So we surrender. And I lay down the boxes I put you in. I lay down the boxes I put you in. You're exceeding my expectations Abundantly more than I hope for So I lay down the boxes I put you in All I've ever needed Is in you, Lord Jesus, beautiful Jesus Nothing compares to that together Jesus beautiful Jesus beautiful Jesus nothing compares to you Jesus beautiful Jesus nothing oh we lift our eyes up we lift our eyes Jesus beautiful Jesus nothing compares to you nothing compares to you Jesus beautiful Jesus nothing compares to you sing it again Jesus Jesus Jesus, nothing compares to you. Jesus, beautiful 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 Jesus, nothing compares to you. Nothing compares. Jesus, beautiful Jesus, nothing compares to you. Jesus, beautiful Jesus. One more time, let's sing that out. Jesus, beautiful Jesus, nothing compares. We adorn you with our praise. Jesus, beautiful Jesus, nothing compares. Let every eye be lifted up. Jesus, beautiful Jesus, nothing compares. To you. We can never get enough. Jesus, we can never beautiful see Jesus, enough. nothing compares. Will cause our hearts to burn with fascination Jesus, for you. Face. We stand I love in awe and wonder. Come on, I love one more time, you. Jesus. Jesus, beautiful Jesus. Nothing can be. God. It is true. That is true. We say as a church, amen to that. Nothing compares to you. Lord, we want to see your face this morning. Lord, we're here to see you, to encounter you, to have your spirit rest on us. Come and do that, Jesus, we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Good morning. My name is Matt Erbaugh. I'm the pastor of spiritual formation here, and we are going to close out the sermon series the, the, what is it called? Course through the chaos. 
Course through the chaos. Let me tell you what, like, I may not know the title of the series, but I know the heart of it. And the heart of it is that we would be a people that don't just survive chaos. That don't just, when the shifting comes, that we just kind of hold on with a death grip and we just barely make it. We want to be a people that actually thrive. And that's the plan and the purpose that the Lord has for us in times like this, that we would thrive. And so as I was thinking about that, how do we thrive? And a lot of the sermon series has been giving us uh, some of the knowledge of God to help us thrive in times like this. But at minimum, if we're going to have a course through the chaos, we need to know, a, we have to have a, a sure a goal, right? At a minimum, we need a goal. We need more than that, but we at least need to know where we're going, where this thing ends. If you're gonna chart a course on a map, you gotta have an end point. And I'll tell you, let's, let's turn to the word of God for that end point because any, any old goal that you choose is not gonna cut it. We need the, the goal that the Lord has for his people. And I believe a, a great place, if you, I mean, there are lots of verses you could go to for the goal, but 1 Peter 1.13, we'll put that on the screen for you. But this is a goal right here, people. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully. Catch that word. Set your hope fully. Here's the goal. On the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming. We've been saying that. He is the king that is coming. He is the king that is returning. And he is the king that is bringing his kingdom with us. And what we need to do in preparation for that is to be a people that have in our hearts cry what, uh, what we would call a Maranatha call. There's a word in the Bible, it's Maranatha. And that was the word that the church, the early church knew very well. Maranatha means come Lord Jesus. And anytime something tragic was happening, you know, you'd hear, you'd hear bad news, the cart cry should be, oh, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. And anytime you're feasting and enjoying yourself and the pleasures uh, that the Lord gives us in this age, our heart's cry should be, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, because it's gonna be even better than this that I'm experiencing right now. And it was such the heart cry of the people in the early church that they would in fact greet each other with the word Maranatha. We need to have a Maranatha spirit where our hope is fully in the revelation of Jesus Christ. And when I say fully, I mean it is not diversified in any way. We need to be a people that every thought, every action, Every yearning and desire of our heart is for Jesus to split open the sky and him to come back and get his people. Now, if we actually were to do that, not just in our thoughts, no, that you know, Jesus is coming back, yeah, we acknowledge that as a truth in scripture and we believe that. But if we were actually to live that out, we would look different. We would act different. And I tell you, a lot of people, even you would you probably feel it in yourself, if I were to really believe that and really to act where every thought was completely and fully in hope of Jesus returning, that might be a little bit weird. That might be a little bit extreme. But I tell you, if we look at this verse, it is the spirit of sobriety, in fact. Your friends and family and your coworkers may think that you've kind of drifted down a strange, bizarre path, but it says here, being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that is gonna be given to us when the revelation of Jesus Christ happens. So it is in fact the spirit of sobriety that has this yearning in our heart for this Maranatha cry. But the question is, how do we hope fully like this? How do we, uh, we've been talking about in one of my discipleship groups that, that 18 inches from the, from the head to the heart is a, only 18 inches, but it is such a long distance. How do we put that firmly as an anchor in our soul? And I wanna suggest again that we don't look anyplace else but the Bible. The Bible has terms for us that are, are meant to get us into this Maranatha cry. And the way that the Bible does that is it, it talks about our relationship with the Lord in terms of a bride and a bridegroom. And when we start to think about the picture of a bride and a bridegroom, this way for us to start hoping fully in Jesus returning starts to become a little bit more clear. I'm reminded of, uh, it was about over a decade ago now that I was able to take a, a trip uh, to Africa 
and you know, I, I was a newlywed at the time. And my wife, my wife stayed at home. I got to go to this trip to Africa, and it was, a, it was a phenomenal trip. And a few days into it, despite being in this great new culture and, and seeing all these amazing things, pretty soon, my, the desire of my heart wasn't to see even more cool stuff. It was to wish, oh, I wish Brittany, my wife, I wish she was here to see this with me. And a few more days went by, and pretty soon, it wasn't, I wish she was here with me. I was like, I really want to be back with her. And, uh, you know, then we got into that second week of the trip, and pretty soon, despite all the, the wonderful things we were seeing and doing on this trip, all I could think about was getting home to my bride. In fact, we, 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 were, we were flying out of Dubai. It's the longest flight ever, Dubai to Houston. It was, I, I didn't sleep a wink. I was so eager to be home. And you know, when you get home from an international flight, you know that you're, you have to pick up your luggage and then recheck it for a domestic flight. I don't know if you've ever done that before, but we were supposed to fly. We flew into Houston and we were gonna fly from Houston to San Antonio. It's one of those things where I'm looking at the clock and I'm like, I don't know if we're gonna make it. I don't know if we're gonna make that connecting flight. It's gonna be really tight. And so I'm waiting at, you know, to get my luggage so I can go through the process of checking it back in again for a domestic flight. And thankfully, my luggage pops out. And I'm with some of my friends, including a, including a young man I was discipling at the time, and their luggage wasn't showing up. And so I waited with them, and I'm looking at the clock, and I'm like, ooh, it's, this is kind of like now or never. And so you know what I did, right? I said to my friends, I said, you know I love you, but I gotta go. And I took off, and I totally ditched them. I said, see ya. And, I, and thankfully there were no little old ladies in the terminal because I probably would have just like ran over them completely. Like I was going to make that flight because I wanted to be home to my wife. How much more? I was two weeks of a sinful man. How much more? 2,000 years our bridegroom has been waiting for us. Yeah. Do you think his heart isn't burning do you think that he is not ready to plow over anything in his way to return to us? He is lovesick for you. Do you hear me? For you, for you, not for the person next to you. He is his desire, his face, his every thinking moment is bent on coming back to us. So why doesn't he just come back to us then? One of the things we've been learning in this series is that he is not ready to return until things are ready for him to return. He is not ready to come back until we are ready for him to come back. And left to our own devices, we would never get there, church. But thankfully, he is in the, he is in the business of making his bride ready. What if I called my wife and said, hey, I made it. I caught the flight, I'm on it right now, I am gonna be home at the scheduled time. And she responded, wait, that's today? <laughs> like, what would have happened in my heart? That's today, Matt? Well, hey, glad you're coming home, but I've actually planned out a few things this week already. I've got a, a girls' night tonight, and tomorrow I'm gonna go do this. So I'd, we'd love to have you home, Matt, but can you push it a couple days? I mean, it's funny, but church, that's us. Hey, Jesus, man, I love for you to come back. But I haven't gone to college yet, if you're a young person. Can you wait? I'd really like to experience that. Can you hold off just a little bit, and then you're free to come back? Or I haven't, I've not been married yet. I'd like to experience that. Or maybe I'm married. I, I haven't gotten kids yet, Lord. Hold off just a little bit. Love you. I really do, but... That's not a wholehearted bride. And Jesus will have a people that set their hope fully on the grace that will be brought to them at the revelation of Jesus Christ. But not only that, he will not only have his bride wholehearted, he will have the fullness of his bride. He will have every single person that's supposed to be a part of this bridal community in it. And so we talked about that a couple weeks ago. His plan before he returns is to usher forth the greatest revival that man has ever seen. And we saw that verse in Revelation where John sees this multitude that nobody can number from every tribe, from every nation, from every tongue. Who are these people? And he says, these are, this is the bride that's come out of the great tribulation. And so he won't come until every person that's supposed to be in this relationship is in this relationship. But not only that, 
he will not come until the kingdoms of this age, the wicked kingdoms of this age that are under the, the rulers of the powers and principalities that are opposed to him have been judged punitively. And he will come in righteous judgment and start to deliver judgments against the evil kingdoms of this world until it is ready for him to return and deliver the final death blow to them. So he has a lot that he is coming to do. And he will be ready in what context? How does he accomplish these things? A wholehearted bride, a, a great revival in the judgments of the wicked kingdoms of this earth. He does it through the context of shaking, which we've been talking about these past seven weeks, and the context of partnering with his bride in that shaking. I mean, when you really think about it, church, what a glorious path we have before us. We will be wholehearted. Church, hear me. We will be wholehearted. We will experience a great revival, and we won't just witness it. The Lord says you will actually be like a John the Baptist. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. You will be the voice that cries out to all the people who are experiencing this shaking, and they're being, they're being, they're being woken up. And they don't know what the shaking means, but we will be the voice that says, this is what it means. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we will be like a Moses, a corporate Moses, that called down in agreement with the Lord, the righteous judgments of the Lord on the evil kingdom of his day was Egypt. What a glory. When I see that, that path, I say, wow, sign me up for that, God. And he will have a bride that's signed up. And so I think, okay, so that's the future. That's the goalpost. But the path is gonna weave there. What's that path look like for us right now? Like today, what is the next step? And so that's what I wanna talk about right now. Because I believe there is a, a next step as we go down this. Remember, it is a glorious path. And I want us to turn to Luke chapter 22. And we're gonna have the verses on the screen if you just wanna hang with me up here. We're gonna start in verses 28 and 29. So Jesus, a little context here. Jesus, this is the, 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 he's meeting with his disciples. It's the last supper. It's close to the end for Jesus and his crucifixion. And he's talking to his disciples and he says, you are those who have stayed with me in my trials. And I assign to you as my father assigned to me a kingdom. Remember, we've been, we've been talking about he, the king is coming and he's got a kingdom for his people and it's the same message for the disciples 2,000 years ago. There's a kingdom, guys. But more than that, verse 30, what's this kingdom like? That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. So you're not just citizens of this kingdom. That's glorious. More than that, you sit at the king's table. Who sits at the king's table? It's his family. You sit with him in intimacy and love and partnership as the beloved child of God. And you sit on thrones, authority, partnership. And for them, because he's speaking specifically to them, it's for their, their realm of authority, their, their realm of uh, throne would be the 12 tribes of Israel because the 12 disciples will sit over the 12 tribes of Israel. But that doesn't mean that we don't have authority too. There's other parts of the Bible, and we may get to some of those verses later, that talk about the authority and the thrones that the Lord has given his church. So what is true here specifically for them is also true for us in a, in a different measure. What a glorious path. Just like I was laying out a glorious path just a second ago, Jesus to his disciples is laying out a glorious path. But what's the next step? Again, our question for the day. Okay, how does that happen, Jesus? And Jesus turns his attention specifically to Peter. And Peter is a representative of the church, I believe. Just everything about him speaks to the church. And he says to him, Simon, Simon, behold, Here's the next step. Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. And it's interesting that even though he's talking specifically to Simon, the two yous there, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you, those yous are actually plural. He's talking to his church here. Church, I believe that as this was the next step for Simon Peter. This is the next step for us as well. And there's a sifting. 
There's a sifting that's common to man that we all experience. We all experience trials. We all experience hardships. We all experience difficulties. And I'm not minimizing those at all. Those are real things. But I believe with all my heart that there is a corporate sifting that is upon us. I don't say that lightly. An ultimate sifting. And again, I don't say it lightly, but I ask you, please don't hear it lightly either. Because in the great tribulation that brings forth this great revival, it says simultaneously there is a great falling away. It is truly a sifting, people. That refines the true bride, but like it says, there's a falling away that goes with this. How sobering is that thought? And so if he were to leave us there, we would, we would be, that, that's intense. But take heart, church, because listen to the next verse in verse 32. But, Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. There's a lot in this verse right here. Notice Jesus isn't saying, hey, I'm praying that even though Jesus is demanding this sifting, we're gonna, we're gonna go right around it. We're gonna miss it completely. You get to avoid it because I'm praying for you. But when Jesus prays for you, whatever he prays for you is accomplished. And so he's praying not that he is removed from this trial, but that he stands firm in the trial, that his faith may not fail. Because that's what the sifting is really all about. Satan can do all sorts of things to your external circumstances, but he cannot destroy your faith. But if he can intensify the circumstances enough, your faith may fail, not because he gets to destroy it, but because we may leave it. And so if Satan is after the destruction of your faith, what is the Lord after in this sifting? Because there must be a reason. God would not permit us to go through this sifting if he didn't have his sovereign, glorious plans in it. And I believe just as Satan is trying to destroy something, I believe that Jesus is trying to destroy something as well in us. Look at the next verse, verses 33 and 34. This is what Jesus is after destroying. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. As much as I love Peter's heart here, and I believe the intentions of this expression are absolutely true, but do you see the strength? Do you see the, the power Peter is holding in his hand right here? And Jesus tells him, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Peter, just like us, is a man filled with pride, with strength, and with the power of our own might. I don't say that in a condemning way. It's, it's reality. Pride is so insidious that it lives sometimes even like a parasite when we have the intentions, I'm gonna follow the Lord. It sits there and says, yeah, but follow him in your own strength. Or I'm gonna resist this sin. Yeah, great, great, in your own strength. And that's the thing that has to go, church. This is the thing the Lord is after to sift us out of. There is a path of the cross awaiting us. And I, want to hear, I want you to hear this a few different ways. So let's go to this verse in Deuteronomy. You can, just, you can just follow along up here from the screen. Deuteronomy 32, 36 says, For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. When? When he sees their power is gone. He's not removing our power out of some sadistic, mean God sort of thing. In compassion, he wants it to be gone so he can lavish us with even more love. And I would love it if this was a thing we could lay down. I would love it if I could say, all right, I'm gonna lay down my pride today. You know, there's pride in us that we don't even know it's there. That's how insidious it is. It can, it can be in us to such a strong extent, but it's like this self-camouflaging thing that we don't even realize it's, it's, it's embedded in us. And the way that it goes is it has to be shattered off. Listen to Daniel, in Daniel 12, verses six and seven. There's a very end times context to this. And Daniel's saying, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? He's been showing all these, these great visions. What's the end? 
When, is, when do we get to that goal, finally, of Jesus returning? And we would say, if we were asked that question, most of us would say, well, there's things that have to happen, like we need to go out and preach the gospel to every tribe, nation, and tongue. And that's absolutely true, but sometimes we forget this prerequisite as well. It happens, when is the end? When the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, then all these things will be finished. You know, last week, Kirk talked a little bit about 9-11, if you remember the story he mentioned where uh, in response to 9-11, we had several representatives that came up and, and, and quoted a verse and they've completely missed the context of it. You know, it was, a, it was a verse where God was actually rebuking the Israelites because they were continuing to walk in power and they're continuing to walk in pride. They had suffered a defeat and they said, you know what the problem is? It's because we had bricks and what we need is hewn stone. You know what the problem is, is? Is they knock down these sycamore trees, but we're gonna replace them with cedar trees. And when I heard that message and I heard what those representatives said, you know what I said in my heart? Here's how insidious pride is. Those fools. How could they say that? But beloved, I don't remember repenting after 9-11, I remember saying, yeah, let's build that tower back. Let's build it bigger, bitter, bigger than ever. And then I'm so self-righteous that when I hear another man saying, let's do that, I'm like, oh, what a fool. Doesn't he know to repent? They're, they're called representatives. They're congressmen. They're representing the people for a reason. It's not because they're so dumb that they just don't get it. It's because they are, I think, prophetically displaying our heart back to us. Yeah. And we mock them for it. You see what pride's like? You see what strength is like? You see why it has to go? So we need to repent. That was the message from last week. Kirk was calling us to a deeper repentance just like what well, we would say, what is repentance? It's a turning. Remember what Jesus said to Peter, when you turn again. He's predicting you're not gonna make it, but your faith failing isn't you falling into sin. It's what you do in that moment. Will you turn rightly? And there's this vital thing I think that we miss in true repentance that we're waiting on. That's truly the next step for us, church. So let's find out what that is. We're gonna go to Luke a little bit later in the chapter. Jesus has just been captured, Luke 22, verse 54. They seized him, Jesus. They led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you're also one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted saying, certainly this man also was with him for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And look at this, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. That word looked has captivated me this week. This is precisely the place, church, where we find ourselves today. We find our, our personal self, corporately as a church, as a nation, at the place where true repentance is needed. And you know what? I, I think that true repentance is, is that turning, but there is a turning that says, I'm gonna turn. You know, sometimes when, when, I, when I sin, and I, oh man, I did it again. And then what rises up in me, you know what? Lord, never again. I'm never gonna do that one again. Or I won't, I won't fail you this way. I, I'm gonna read more, I'm gonna pray more, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to my guys in my discipleship, discipleship group about this. There's gonna be greater accountability. What I'm really saying is these stones, they weren't enough, I'm gonna get bigger stones. And so even though the intention of my heart, the turn was right, intellectually, I made the right decision, 
that pride, that power, that strength was just sown all through it. As a nation, as we're being called to repentance, as a church, as we're being called to repentance, our heart is, is what's, it's, it's contaminated. We're stuck. And sometimes you were like, why is the Lord not breaking the power of the sin in my life? And it's because the Lord says, you're not being broken. You still need to be shattered. You keep rising back up. True repentance is more than turning. It's turning with the right heart. But I don't want you to mistake this look that, that, that Peter got. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. What a gaze that must have been. And you're reading it wrong if you think it was a gaze of anger. You don't know Jesus if you, if you look and you see that and you say, he's disappointment. He's got disappointment in his eyes. I tell you, it was a look of the most intense love. I believe in that very moment he was praying for him, like he said he would. And here's what happens, verse 62. And when a man gets that look, when you truly get that look, people, you go out and you weep bitterly. There's no thought of, oh man, next time. Come on, Lord, send somebody else to ask me about him because then I'm gonna stand up and say, yeah, I know him. When you see that look of love, you are a shattered person. You are a sifted follower of Christ. But hear me in this church, when you've been shattered and empty, then you can be filled. When you come to terms with your utter weakness, then Christ can be strong in you. You know, before this even happened, Peter actually rebukes the Lord when he starts to talk about the path of the cross. Little did he know that one day Peter's own life would end on a cross as he was crucified upside down. But I tell you, church, listen, before Peter hung on that cross, he was already a dead man. Because of this moment, before he was on that cross, he was a dead man but alive in Christ. So much so that when he would walk through the streets of Jerusalem, they would bring out the sick, that maybe his shadow would touch them and they'd be healed. He was so dead to himself but alive in Christ that when he would preach, 3,000 would come to know Jesus in one moment. And it wasn't just a, yeah, I think I'll do this. There were people with pierced hearts because a man who's been pierced with this look can preach in a way that pierces hearts. A man that is dead can preach in a way that bring people to life. And don't just think that this is for Peter, church, because this is Peter, and Jesus said this about him. You are Peter, and on this rock, God will build his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. You hear that, church? That's for you. You're gonna be built on the same foundation that Peter experienced in that moment. And so, church, today, as we, I believe we stand at the edge of the wilderness of testing. And before us, there's one path through this wilderness. It's the path of the cross. And we would never take that path. Yet Jesus beckons us, follow me. I love the picture in Song of Solomon where it talks about the wilderness and it talks about the bride and the bridegroom. And it says, who is this coming out of the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? God is calling us to be a leaning people sapped of our own strength, sapped of our own power, sapped of our own self-sufficiency so that we can be filled with the glory of God. In his heart, a man plants his course, but the Lord determines his steps. I believe that he has determined that those steps are right at the edge of the wilderness, even now. Again, we wouldn't choose this path, but it is upon us, church. And so what do we do? We're gonna have the band come on back up. Again, I don't say these things lightly, but I ask you not to hear them lightly. The great sifting that is coming for us, and some of you I know are even in it, even now. But I say to you that as you go through this and you have turned and you have been broken, help your brothers. Just like he exhorted Jesus to do. 
Once you've turned, you're there to strengthen your brothers. But we have to go through it ourselves first. And this is not something we can work up. It says in Timothy that the Lord grants us repentance. We can't stir up. We can't, we can't force God to look at us in this way, but he will. He is willing. Are we willing to look him back in the eyes? And so I would ask us, as we, as we close with this song, let's do business with the Lord. God, would you, let's even now, let's just close our eyes. Lord, even now, Lord God, we ask for you to intercede on our behalf. Lord, yeah, you said you would pray for us, God. Would you intercede? You said you live to make intercession. And so, Lord, intercede for us now. Lord, I pray that you would give us the look. Lord, would, we, would you give us a look that shatters all pride? Would you give us a look that lets us know who we are, your bride, and so that we can't even bear the thought of our sin because not because of what it says about our strength, not because of what it says about our level of morality, but because of what it says about how we've treated our beloved. Grant repentance to this people, I pray. Church, we need to cry out for it. And so as the song is played, do business with the Lord. Say, Lord, I can't walk this path, but will you stand next to me so that I have something to lean on? We need you, Jesus. Come and rest on us, God, we pray. In Jesus' name. Calm down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Calm down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room,
your spirit that lives in me. How we need you, our helper. How we need you. As you are faithful to complete the work you started. Yes, you are faithful to complete the work you started. Oh, refiner's fire. Yes, God, that is our corporate declaration. The cry of our hearts, fill us up, you're all we want. God, I pray for these, uh, for my faith family. God, I pray this week, would you find them in certain places? Would you find me in certain places and just cause that moment uh, to, to, to grab my attention such that I'll be realigned with some of the things that I heard today. The week gets messed up and I get distracted. Um, I get off that trail. And so God, I pray that this week you just provide each one of us a moment where you just grab our attention again and we take that right step towards obedience. It's in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. What an encouraging word from Pastor Matt Herbal. I just want to remind you guys, as always, be sure to reach out to someone, maybe a family member or a friend, and talk about what God's stirring in your heart. Maybe something that challenged you or convicted you or just an encouraging thing. And as always, stay up to date on everything going on at Crossbridge on our website. Well, here are some things that are going on in our Crossbridge family this week that you and your family can connect with. First thing is our Trunk or Treat. It's happening this coming Saturday, October 31st, 2 to 4 p.m. here at Crossbridge. So get your kiddos in the car in their friendly costumes. You guys can drive around our campus and receive candy from our life groups, and it's just going to be a really sweet time for your families. Something I'm super excited about is we're going to have our young adult retreat. So if you're an 18 to 26 year old, this is going to be a great time to take a step into community, to worship Jesus together and to get into his word. So be sure and sign up for that. You can email me at daniel at crossbridgecommunitychurch.com for more info and to sign up for that. It's going to be awesome. Dan, that's going to be like the best weekend ever. I'm, really I'm super excited. excited. <laughs> Another thing um, going on at Crossbridge is we are going to make more room for our kids zone. And with that, we need more volunteers. So we need 20 more volunteers. Um, and so if that's something that's stirring in your heart that you can help us out with, email Liz at crossbridgecommunitychurch.com. And just a reminder again, our second service moves to 1015 next Sunday. So get prepared for that. It was awesome. We're so glad you joined us today. We'll see you guys next week. Bye.